Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Fundamental Facts presentation, Jesus discusses how principles of law that are an expression of God's personality, character, attributes, nature, and desires govern God's laws and presents some fundamental facts about God, God's principles, and God's laws. Recorded on the 5th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. So today is is probably our longest day in a way because we've got six main changes of subject along with the opening address which is about fundamental facts so there's seven talks all together and um and we've only got the whole day to do these seven different subjects and so we're changing the subject quite frequently today so that is going to be a bit difficult uh, compared to what we've done in previous groups but if you can stick with us for the day, I'm sure at the end of the day you'll have enjoyed the material that we present for you. Um, a lot of this material, um, as I said last night, a lot of this material has never been presented before in the way we're presenting it now. And, and if we can turn off my alarm... <laughs> now that's, that's me. Time to start. That's time to start. <laughs> Why would he set it at 10.30? I did, but why did I do that? Anyway, it's 10, it's 10.30, guys. I can start now. <laughs> hopefully it won't... Uh, hopefully I haven't got it at each talk or something like that. No, I'm pretty right with that, I think. All right. Now, we had a lot of difficulty putting this program together because there's so much information and not enough time really to share it all with you. So what we've decided to do is sort of summarise a lot of the information rather than present the detail. And that's going to mean, of course, that we skip over many of the points, particularly when we come to the principal discussions. We will skip over many of the points we would have liked to have made. But we feel that if we can give you a broad summary, then that begins your process of investigation of these particular principles. And, uh, and begins your process of sort of understanding that there's more to things than what you've believed at this point. So uh, I think for many of you, some of you have been listening now for quite a few years, and for many of you, you've sort of, to a deal, I feel to a large degree, believe that almost what we've presented now is all there is to know, and nothing could be further than from the truth, actually. There is, uh, we've only presented just a very small portion of what there is to know, of course. And uh, you would expect that, would you not, if you understood what an infinite universe, or particularly an infinite God, would be like. You would expect that there would be lots to know. And so what we want to do with this discussion, Fundamental Facts, is to introduce you to four basic fundamental facts, in, or four basic fundamental areas that we would like to discuss some facts with you about. Now, these are very basic facts. They, we are not going to have a chance to go into them in great detail, just as we are not going to go into a lot of detail with any other discussion we're going to have with you for the entire week. There isn't the time. And, and unfortunately, or fortunately, every one of these areas of investigation can take you years, if not centuries, of time. So, so we're going to just introduce them to you and, and hopefully inspire your interest in that process of discovery. Does that make sense to everyone? So let's look at the four areas that we want to discuss with you in this talk, which is the fundamental facts talk. Basically, we want to talk to you about God, give you some fundamental facts about God. We want to talk about God's universe and give you some fundamental facts about the universe itself, and then about God's principles and about God's laws. And these fundamental facts are very, very basic facts and we could have added many more to them, of course, but we felt that just if we could give you a few basic facts, that will help lay some groundwork for the future of our discussion this week. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, so let's start with some fundamental facts about God. Um, whoops, I've gone backwards instead of forwards. So 
First fundamental fact about God. God is an infinite entity. Now, there are some logical points that we need to um, understand as a result of that statement. If God is an infinite entity, can God get bigger? Yes or no? How many say yes? How many say no? <laughs> Four of us say no, and we're right. <laughs> It's impossible for an infinite thing to get bigger. It's already infinite. Interesting thought. Okay, so if God is the infinite oversoul of the universe, then where are we? If something is infinite, where does all other matter fit? Where do you think? Any ideas? Don't they fit inside the infinite? You've never thought about that before, obviously. <laughs> right. so, so what we're stating here, when we talk about God being an infinite God, we're basically stating that God cannot get any bigger or larger. This is one reason why God is unchangeable. Because God is not going to get bigger or larger. He's already infinite. And on top of that, it means that every one of God's qualities has an infinite perspective to it. Right? And in fact, there is a principle that we haven't even put on the list called the infinity principle, which God has designed into every one of God's laws and principles. That infinite infinity is designed as a part of the process because God is an infinite being. It then makes sense that everything God creates has the perspective or the, pers the prospect of becoming such, of become by working towards <coughs> infinity, if you could call it that way. So this this as avenue of infinity means, from God's from God's perspective, we are inside God, and from our perspective, we don't see it that way generally, do we? We sort of see ourselves as, we, well, we are free-thinking, free-feeling beings. God created it that way. But we think of ourselves as somehow external to God. But it's only an illusion of our own creation. Right. So, very first point. Interesting point, right? That God is an infinite being, therefore we exist within God in some way and we'll describe in some way because it's, you've got to remember that the universe is multi-dimensional so when you talk about multi-dimensional infinity you start getting into some pretty complicated mathematical subjects which we won't cover <laughs> in, our, in our discussion but it's important for us to understand that we are really within God even though we have the illusion that we are not yeah. But God's still given you the ability to have your own will, to be able to, the capacity to make your own choices and decisions. In some ways, we're a bit like a bacteria inside of a human. <laughs> does that make sense? A bacteria still exists, it, it does its own thing, but it has laws and, and everything that's inside the human that govern how it can function and operate and where it can live and all those kind of things too. So in some ways we're a bit like that. But of course, God doesn't see you as a bacteria. Right? <laughs> yeah. God sees you as the highest, most complex of his creations. So obviously God sees it quite differently. And then we come down to the fact that God has nature or personality or character. So if we imagine this board is infinity, right? then we could say that inside of this infinite being, there are things that we will draw, uh, draw as sort of concentric circles, if you like, as a way of representing them. So we have the outside concentric circle, which is about God's character and God's nature and God's attributes. So, and here we're referring to God's personality, character, attributes and nature. Now, because God is an infinite being, that means that every one of God's character, uh, God's bit of God's nature or character or attributes, 
have, have an infinite part to them, which means that when we say, we could say, for example, that God is the personification of wisdom. In other words, God has infinite wisdom. Now, if God has infinite wisdom, we could make this statement, couldn't we? We could say God, God is, sorry, just, God is wisdom. But that doesn't mean that wisdom is the only thing God is. Does that make sense? Because, so that's not equal to, so it's not equal to saying that wisdom is God. Because that's not true at all. Wisdom is not God, actually. So wisdom actually is not God. Wisdom is just an attribute of God. So we can say God is wisdom because God is the infinite expression of wisdom. But wisdom is not God. Wisdom is just a, a part of God's attributes. One of many, potentially, an infinite number of attributes, actually. You think if you have an infinite being, there is potentially an infinite number of attributes to that being. Which makes sense, right? Or are we starting to... Already losing, don't no, make sense. Everyone's right. So, so if God is wisdom, we can say that that is a truth, but we can't say that wisdom is God. Wisdom is not God, wisdom is just a part of God, one of God's attributes. The same with love. You could say God is love, that is a truth, in that God is the infinite expression of love, but love is not God. Love is just an attribute, a part of God's character, one part of many things that God is. Does everyone get that idea or concept? It's important that you do because we often attribute, a, uh, un unfortunately attribute a, a characteristic of God and we start calling that particular characteristic God itself. And this is where humanity often gets into philosophical arguments that are way out of logical reasoning, but also way out of the reality with regard to God's existence. Right. So we could say God is justice. But justice is not God. Justice is just an attribute, a characteristic of God. Yeah. And we could keep going down. God is compassion. But compassion is not God. Compassion is just an attribute of God. Does that make sense? If we think of it that way, we'll start seeing that God is the infinite expression of every possible attribute. But only every possible attribute that comes from God, not attributes that come from humanity. So it would be wrong to say God is anger. Because anger does not exist in God. Right? Anger is a human creation based upon suppression or the desire to suppress emotion. And God doesn't suppress emotion. So therefore God has no anger. So it would be wrong to say God is anger and anger is definitely not God. Or any part of God's attributes. So there are parts of things that we can say belong to God and then there's other things that definitely do not belong to God. And in fact, if anger belonged to God, the reality is that all of you probably wouldn't be sitting here at the moment. You would all be destroyed because of God's rage. Right? If God, is the in, if God was the infinite expression of every quality and therefore God is the infinite expression of anger, then can you see that he would infinitely express his anger by automatically deleting every possible thing he's ever created? It's a, it's a physical impossibility. So there are qualities that don't belong to God at all that are just human creations. So there's a whole f forms of philosophy that say the opposite to that. That if, if we are able to get angry, then it means God is able to get angry. And in fact, it basically anthropomorphizes God. Is that the word I'm looking for? Yes, making God or turning God into a human. Right? And, and we can't do that. 
God far exceeds human understanding because our, we are finite beings. Therefore, we are completely different in some ways to an infinite being. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, the chances of, of us ever becoming an infinite being, I would say, are pretty remote, given the fact that if God is an infinite being, how can you have two infinite beings? It's no, there's no logical or mathematical sense to that. We will always exist within God. It's just whether we are aware of that or not. Now, the majority of us remain emotionally unaware of that. So here we go. We've got God's nature now. We've, we see that each attribute is completed and perfected in God, and each attribute is not God, but only a part of God. And God's full personality attributes, character, nature, and desires are infinite. So now we've got some percep perception, understanding of God herself, God himself. So whenever you're thinking of limitation, we are automatically thinking out of harmony with the way God thinks. To God, there is no limitation anywhere. There is also potentially no limitation to your own full degradation. But God has put into place things, laws, principles that prevent that occurring for your own sake. Uh, which we'll talk about later. So there's our basic statements about God that we wanted to get across to you, the fundamental fact about God's infinite nature. Now, it's important to understand that, that this is the being we're speaking of, so that we can start to understand the, the way the principles work. Huh? So within God's nature, we have another, you could call it another sort of co-centric circle here now. And what, are the, what is that circle? You've seen your diagram, so what, what is that circle? So principles. Okay, so we now have this area called God's principles. Now God's principles are really controlled by God's personality. So the more you understand about God's principles, the more you can understand about God's true personality, what God's character and attributes really are. The principles have all been created as an expression of God's nature and personality. And there are many, as you can imagine, many principles. There are potentially an infinite number of principles. Huh? Potentially, because of God's infinite nature. Huh? So we, as humanity, are going to be forever finding out new things about God and forever finding out new principles that we didn't know existed before about God. Now, why has God designed a universe like that? Well, you can see the primary reason is to make life interesting, <laughs> <laughs> to keep you engaged for the rest of your existence, right? That's why God's done that. Obviously, if God created a limited system, you'd get to the point where you understand everything, and then what would you do? You'd be bored probably, right? There's nothing more to know. Start, you do this and do that, but it'll all start feeling like just the same thing all over again. And what does that feel like? Well, many of you have practiced your whole life like that, so you've got some idea of what that feels like, right? In the sense that you just engage the same process all over again. So you might shift location or you might go to a new country, but then you fall in the same patterns and it's the same thing all over again. Well, God's not. Well, God wants to expand our, us as our, in our capacity constantly transforming our abilities, God doesn't want you to stay stuck in the same place. Remember in the very first group we said, we've got to get used to change. Well, that's because we, as, an in, as a, a finite being, can approach the infinite only by changing. 
So change is going to be also a fact of our life. Now, if we're resistive to change, you can see we've got a fairly big problem, right? From an emotional perspective. Yeah? Okay, so there we have God's principles. Now, God's principles govern or control what laws get created now. So every single law of which there are an infinite, potentially infinite amount, every single law is governed by the principles and by all principles usually at the same time. Although there are some principles that apply specifically to God's highest creation. But any principle that is not specifically attached to God's highest creation is automatically applied to every single law in the system. Right. So now we have a, an idea. Well, we've got lots and lots of laws. <laughs> Scary how many there might be, right, if you contemplate it. We'll talk about that during our discussions over the next few weeks, over the next week. Um, but there we are. We've got lots of these laws, but... But to understand them, all we really need to do is to grasp the principles. And to understand the principles, all we really need to do is have a relationship with God so we can feel God's personality, God's nature. Right? So this is why the way God is designed is all about this relationship with God. Because without the relationship with God... There's, it is not possible for us to understand the principles, nor is it possible for us to grasp the laws, and also, as a subsequent result, it is not possible to understand the next layer, and of which there are multiple layers, you'll learn as we go through, which is the universe itself. We're not going to understand how we fit in it, how, how it works, what happens with us, what happens with the universe, what happens in terms of the interactions between ourselves and the universe and so forth, unless we truly can connect with God at some point. Now, when we've talked about in the past, we, we've talked about you know, the benefits of having a relationship with God and so forth in the past, many of you have not really understood how important it is, intrinsic it is, to your understanding even of yourself or of the universe around you or of, or of your relationship between the self and the universe. And, and, and as a result, we sort of dismiss the importance of some, the ravings of some Jesus lunatic, right? Which we often do. Like in the first century, that was a common feeling projected at me. And even nowadays, it is a common feeling you guys project at me at times. Surely that's not possible. I don't agree with that. How is that possible, right? It's going, going through our heads constantly. And the reason why that does is because we're not contemplating things from a really logical perspective. If we were contemplating that God is a, in, an infinite being, then we would begin contemplating that perhaps there must be either a fast way of finding out about all of the universe that we live in and, and also a slow way. And let's face it, most of us would have to admit we're probably engaging the slow way, right? Because, because we don't understand much of it and, and, and finding it difficult to connect to God's nature. And as a result, we're, we're engaged in this process of experimentation with each single law and each single creation, of which there are an infinite number. So, you know, you think about the slow progress of that. If there's an infinite number of creations, an infinite number of laws, me experimenting with one law and one creation, can you see that in itself is going to, it might take hundreds of years and, and from humankind sometimes it's taken thousands of years to find out what we've already found out about some of these laws and, and creations, physical laws and creations. And, and we're there discovering and trying to discover through this whole period of time, but we're only doing it one at a time. So, of course, it feels a bit slow. Right? And laborious, and sometimes we get a bit tired with that process. And all of that really can be removed if we connect with the source of the creation and we start understanding and connecting and feeling God's nature and personality. Now, very interestingly, God has created two primary principles, which are the very first principles we're going to discuss in the next talk after the Q&A, after this Q&A. 
And what uh, those two primary principles we've already know are love and truth, right? But what is love and what is truth? Well, if we examine it from God's nature's perspective, love is not love and emotion. So we could ask the question, how does God communicate with us? Well, God communicates with us through these things, which are related to love. But they also have to be sincere emotions, don't they? They can't be ones that we manufacture or fake. Right? So God's not interested in that. So from God's perspective, emotions are love and truth. Does that make sense to you? Now, a part of this communication, this is emotional fact, if you like, is the way God communicates, through emotional fact. Facts are described how? Mathematically. So you could say that mass is a language of God. Just like emotions are the language of God, maths are a langu the language of God. Now that just really stuffs us up, doesn't it? <laughs> because not only are we shut down to our emotions, the majority of us are also shut down to mathematics. <laughs> the very two ways in which God communicates love and truth through the rest of his creation are the very two ways that we primarily are shut down to communication. And you can see how that might have happened, can't you? As you remove yourself from God, you're removing yourself from the ways or the methods that God uses to communicate, and you're removing yourself from these two things, emotions and mathematical principles. Now, this is one reason why when you notice a scientist finds a new formula, what does he do? He's, no, he's like, he's excited. Right? Full of desire and passion about that. So many times scientists connect to this emotional form of communication because they've just discovered a new mathematical way of communicating with the universe, which unbeknown to them is actually a new thing that they've now discovered about God. Of course they're going to get excited. Unfortunately, of course, most of them don't believe in God, so that makes it difficult to actually learn more very rapidly. But I just thought it was interesting that God communicates in this method. The very two methods that we are shut down generally as a human race, we rely on specific people to do the mass for us and the rest of the humanity basically ignores it. And if you think about emotions, we are definitely very shut down to the expression, the loving expression of emotion, the way God communicates. So we need to, can you see why we need to learn about like facts? Facts are the way God communicates with us along with feelings. Facts and feelings together are the facts as far as God is concerned of the universe, everything around you, including God's nature. And it's lovely that God's given us this means of understanding, even if we are not emotionally connected, we can still connect through mathematical processes to find out things about God's nature. God's given us a number of ways. Not a number of ways, how many ways? <laughs> An infinite number of ways to discover God. You see? So there we have the fundamental facts about God. We've now created our diagram where we've got this diagram and you'll find the diagram gets complicated, gets a bit complicated because there's actually more to it than what we're describing here. But you can see that God's creations are within a hierarchy of law. Law governs the creation. So law becomes a framework for creation to exist in. And as I said to you last night in our introduction, it's very interesting, isn't it, how, you know, if you've ever tried to create anything, making a law to govern that thing you've created is so hard to even contemplate doing, 
And so most of the time what happens is our creations are not governed by our laws, they are governed by God's laws. So for example, we create a home, we build it out of wood. But God's laws are wood is dead. The wood we're using is dead, it's not growing. So God is going to turn that wood into dust through a number of processes. A lot of animals and creatures have been created specifically for the purpose of destroying that dead wood and turning it into other forms for life to continue. So from the moment we've built our house, God's destroying it. Right? Just a simple thing like that. The moment we build a house, God's already destroying it. God's already having all of his processes because it's dead, it's not living. It has to be destroyed to be turned into something that's good for a life down the track. Interesting, huh? There we are, we create a building. We've put a lot of effort and time into it. We put a lot of energy into it, a lot of resources into it, of which we kill most of them to put into it, and then only to find that all of God's laws are working against us right from the get-go. Uh, you can see that it would be more appropriate, wouldn't it, to come up with something that's a bit different than that, so that God's laws are not working against it. But we don't think that far ahead, do we, as humans? We just think, no, oh, 25, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, as long as it lasts my lifetime, who cares whether it gets destroyed after that? But the, and that's another principle that we've just broken there, but anyway. So we, we start to see that actually the way in which we engage this universe around us is very uneconomical. We're wasting huge amounts of our life and time just because we don't want to understand the law. If we understood the law, we'd do something different. So this is one reason why it's so important to understand the law. So the law governs the universe itself, all on living matter and the living creatures, as well as God's highest creation, the human soul. That's what the laws govern. incredible system and the more you investigate it the more you realize you don't know about it because of God being an infinite being so all we can do is come to approach God's knowledge through a process of discovery that we can engage. Now you have a slow process of discovery which is the experimental step-by-step -step, one at a time discovery process or you've got a rapid process of discovery which is the connection to God's feelings, God's personality and nature, to the mathematics of the universe and absorbing that information as a part of your soul-based connection with God. That's your, that are your two options really. One is very slow, needs to be quite methodical, takes many thousands of years to come to know a few basic facts. One way you can, the other way, you're still growing in knowledge. It's not instant. It's no, no such thing as instantaneous change. But you're growing in knowledge very rapidly because you're connecting to the very source of the knowledge, the very being that created the system. So there's our diagram, which we, you can ask questions about in the Q&A, which follows this discussion. Okay. So looking at God's principles, you can see, in summary, God's principles form a framework for the laws. Each law is governed by the principles automatically and automatically achieves the goals and the objectives of the principles. So each law that's created must automatically achieve those objectives. And remember, these objectives come from God's personality, God's feelings about that. And then God's principles can be grouped together into, into different groups. These layer here, can, we can group them together. Now, you've got to be very careful with the rest of our discussion, really, because you can get so intellectually bogged down in it, if you're not careful, that you start thinking either that you know everything about it when we barely know or we're scratching the barely scratching the surface even putting a slight smudge on the surface of what we're going to be discussing but also it's it's important to understand because of god's infinite nature 
there's obviously going to be a lot to discover about every single thing. Right? And if you're connected with God at the soul level and your soul expands, you have the capacity to understand it. But if you don't connect with God at the soul level, you still have the capacity to understand intellectually parts of it, but you're not going to understand it completely ever. Right? And by the way, because of God's infinite nature, all of us are never going to completely understand things the way God understands them. We'll only ever be approaching God's understanding. So there's the principles. Now what we're going to do in this discussion, as you've seen in your outlines, we're going to be discussing the foundation principles, which are the principles specifically relating to things like um, that govern all of creation and all of the laws that govern creation. So uh, what we've classified as foundation principles, there's obviously a lot more of them, right? But we're going to discuss just some basic ones. Then we're going to go in our second session to the order principles and discuss the order principles. These principles apply to all creation as well. Right? And then we're going to discuss the principles that have been applied to the human soul specifically that affect your, un your ability to be able to understand all of this stuff in the long run. But of course there must be more principles there as well, mustn't there, to discover and talk about. We're just these are the ones that we'll have time to discuss and talk about. So when we come to God's laws, this part now, they are self-maintaining creations of God. They are governed by the principles, which in turn are governed by the personality and nature of God. They're powered by God's energy. So you must you must see there from that kind of statement that. God must have an immense amount of energy. How much energy does God have? Infinite. An infinite amount of energy. You're getting an idea. Provide, they provide loving consequences or benefits when they are obeyed. Now this is something unique to God's laws in comparison to human law. God's laws have benefits when you obey them. Human law usually doesn't reward you for any obedience. It only penalises you for disobedience. Well, God's laws provide loving consequences or correction when they are disobeyed. So the, the purpose of God's laws are not to, you know, to create trauma and pain and suffering for you, but to indicate to you that you need some kind of correction if you, if you want to become happy. That's the purpose of the corrective process of God's laws. It's lovely, isn't it? It's just beautiful how God's done that. So what are some basic facts? We'll go through these fairly rapidly. So there's potentially an infinite number of laws that exist. Now, you can see straight away that any discussion about individual law is going to be almost wasting our time because as we're talking about it, there's hundreds of laws that have probably been created in that moment that we talked about that one law and we're already behind the eight ball, as the saying goes. We're already behind the whole process of understanding. So we're going to be in a process of eternal discovery of those laws. It makes sense, doesn't it? Obviously. New laws are created every moment. We cannot discuss each law at the speed it's being created. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to understand, right? And in fact, it would be quite a mistake to decide to avoid understanding for the sake of your own happiness and your own eternal future. So that's an irony that many people start going, well, if that's the case, then I might as well just give up and stay ignorant. And ignorance is not bliss, right? Another fact, understanding God's principles and laws requires understanding God's character and their nature. So you can see that if I refuse to connect to God, I'm automatically refusing understanding of a lot of things by default. So it makes sense. If you connect to God, you'll get some understanding. If you don't connect to God, then your understanding is going to be limited. There's also the problem with connecting to God, how we connect to God, which we'll discuss later. Even intellectually, it's far more productive to discuss these things than it is to discuss these things, obviously. There's, there's less of these things, although potentially an infinite amount, there's less in the sense that they govern 
large numbers of laws. So one principle, for example, the law of love, govern, the principle of love governs every law. So if you get love, you get every law. Does that make sense? And this is why you must seek first God's love to understand. Because if you can do that, then you'll get every law. So it makes sense to do the thing that's going to give you the most understanding in the most rapid way. If you think about it, it's almost a scientific process, isn't it? It makes sense, it's logical, factual, scientific process. Understanding God's law requires following God's way. Now, following God's way allows emotional and intellectual understanding of the fundamental details. Right? Now, unless humans are transformed at the soul level, the mind's intellectual capacity and the soul's feeling capacity is not great enough to actually understand everything. So we need to grow so that we can understand. We need to grow and change. We, we don't want to remain in this really limited... The more we limit ourselves and the more we maintain our own illusion of separation... Remember, it is an illusion created by our own imagination, but unfortunately a part of our factual emotional state. That is what's creating our separation. And if, unless we address that issue, we're going to really struggle with understanding and grasping not only God's law, laws, but also God's principles and even God's character and nature, obviously. Very important that we follow God's way to do it. Now, the laws are complex, intricate and mathematically defined. Now, we're not going to go through the mathematical definition of any law. In fact, to go through just the mathematical definition of fluid dynamics, which is one set of laws that humankind have actually discovered a fair bit about at this stage, would take years and years and years and years of your time. Just that one area. Now, that affects flight. Fluid dynamics is... Aerodynamics is a subset of the fluid dynamics discussion. You follow? Fluid dynamics being the way gases or fluids work, either in vacuums or in an atmosphere, and what happens when things interact with those particular substances, right? So aerodynamics is all about what happens when a substance interacts with the air, which is a mixture of different gases. Right? <laughs> We'll talk about aerodynamics a bit, but remember we're only talking about a little subset of aerodynamics. And in fact, what we're going to do with the, when we present the laws to you is we've decided that one way we can illustrate some of the principles is to get two basic laws that you know a little bit about, gravity and aerodynamics, because you've used both of them, and, and then see how each principle has, has actually the effect on those laws. Does that make sense? That's why we've carried that theme most of the way through the discussion. So they're complex, mathematically defined, they have structure, they, have fundam they form the fundamental scientific truth of the universe. And my feeling is, if you're a scientist, you want to know this stuff. That, that's my feeling. If you, if you were a scientist, you'd really want to know this stuff because, it, because you, you can more rapidly understand and assimilate truths of the universe by understanding. Another thing is that the laws cannot be broken. You have the illusion of breaking them. <laughs> you think you're getting away with it, but you're not. You can attempt to rebel, but the rebellion is not successful. All right. So you know how when you're a, a child growing into an adult, sometimes we have an oppressive family or whatever, and so we start rebelling against the family. And we can usually successfully, if we, particularly if we do it emotionally, we can completely remove ourselves from that family if we want and totally rebel about everything that they've ever decided for our life. Well, you can't do that with God. You only have the illusion of doing that, the emotional illusion of doing that. So we can't exist outside of God's laws and the laws themselves have natural workings and we can't exist outside of the natural workings of the law. Now you find that that's actually a good thing because if, if, you, if you could, man, everything in life would be more chaotic than it even is now. right? 
And when I say that it even is now, the only reason why our life's chaotic is because we are choosing to remain in this emotional illusion, which we retain. So when it comes to our, myself and Mary's time, we've spent a lot of our time examining God's laws and principles. The main reason why is because it tells us more about God's nature and character and God is our favourite subject, so of course we're going to try to spend a bit of time discovering more and more about God and that's why we spend a lot of our time understanding these principles and laws. Does that make sense? But, but do you think in 34 hours we're going to <laughs> be able to transmit that understanding? The reality is even at this stage... I can't even remember everything yet about what we've discovered. So I definitely can't share everything that I, particularly the parts that I can't remember. I'm only telling you things I can remember. Does that make sense? So, but trust me, there's a lot, you know, we could be going on for the next 25, 30 years easily discussing every single day, four or five hours a day, what I can remember. But in the end, as we grow, as Mary and I grow, there will be more we can remember. And what we're hoping to achieve is get into a state where we can not only talk about the law, but actually physically demonstrate its use and operation. That makes sense? And when that time comes, if we ever get to that time on the planet, you know, that's what we're working towards. If that, when that time comes, each of you will have a lot stronger faith then in this, in this information, won't you? because you'll actually see it in operation. Yeah, so that's our goal. And that's why we spend a lot of time working on ourselves. Now, our spirit friends just had a few comments, and I know I'm a little over time in this talk already, I think. Am I? What's my finish time? I'll just check. I'm 20, I'm 15, I've five minutes. I'm pretty good. I'm right on time. And what I, I just would like to say what our, spirits, our friends wanted to say to you about this particular discussion for the week. The audience must be aware of attempts to intellectualise and categorise law. The reality is we've placed these principles into categories to aid your understanding only. Does that make sense? So don't think that God's up there going, yes, I've got this love principle and uh, you know, I've got this economy principle. All we've done is we've tried to see the, from the nature of God and so from the principles that God has, we've outlined the principle and we can see the principle and there's many spirits in the spirit world, as you can imagine, particularly celestial spirits in the spirit world who are fully, the whole, a lot of their time is about you know, finding more about these things. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of information about it. And what we're trying to do here in this discussion with you is to categorise the information to present it in a simple enough manner that you can begin to grasp the basic concepts of it. Does that make sense? So don't think that in some point in the future you might not have to change some of those concepts because you definitely will. It's just we're trying to put it together in a simple, fairly comprehensively simple manner in, a, in order for you to, to aid your understanding, that's all. They said the sum total of the law is infinitely greater than the parts Jesus will be able to explain to you in the time that he has available. Now, can you see if there's an infinite amount of laws, 34 hours of discussion is a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Automatically. Uh, so you can see that. God's laws have intricate workings and it cannot be assumed that the small amount of principles Jesus shares with you for the purpose of beginning your awakening to the understanding of God's loving laws are a complete discussion or even anything more than a brief introduction to the subject. Like I said, a brief <laughs> stroking of the surface, not even making a mark, really. God's design of law is far too complex to explain to the audience in their current condition. You, soul condition is the, is the important thing to gain to understand God's nature and personality, and therefore understanding God's principles, soul condition becomes the most important thing to gain. So as you grow towards God, far more will become clear to you and more truth will be understood. And we've created this group, Jesus has created this group to hopefully inspire you on the path of discovering God's laws and to demonstrate to you the wealth of truth that God has available to those who seek for it. So that's their comment to you. 
And we would like to, uh, like we agree wholeheartedly with their comment there. We feel quite strongly that unless you grasp that growth is required to understand, then it's going to be difficult for you to, to understand many of the principles we discuss. All right, so we come to the end of our discussion. We have understand now the basic concept, thinking this whiteboard is God. And remember, God's infinite, so this whiteboard is an infinite whiteboard now. God's nature contained within God's entity, God as the entity, and God's principles becoming a part or the expression of God's personality and nature. And therefore, God's laws get created as a result of the principles that govern them for the sake of God's universe, for the sake of creation to exist. And we will just build on that a bit throughout the group. We won't sort of extend you too far with that concept, but just as a few additional concepts as you learn later in the group about there being multiple universes, if you could call them such, and how there's layers or hierarchical structure to the laws. So laws, universe, laws, universe, laws, universe, and we'll see that later. But at this stage, that's a sort of a basic understanding of where we're heading. That makes sense? All right, so there we have our diagram. There we see it on the board there. It's a bit prettier there. And we want to remind you that the principles uh, we're just discussing, uh, and in fact, we probably won't get to the definition or the objectives. We will sometimes. But most of the time, all we're going to be able to do is give you a summary and the, the other things, the definition, the objectives, the application, and what the principle reveals about God's character and nature, you're going to have to read from the outline. And you can ask questions about any of those things with, when we discuss these principles. But you remember, this is very important, that each discussion is a very basic consideration of the subject. It's very important that you understand that. Now, we're doing this because we want to, firstly, uh, demonstrate to you the importance of understanding God's laws, but we're also doing it because before you can truly understand sin, you need to understand God's principles. So this is why we need to discuss many of God's principles, so that you can grasp an understanding of sin, so then you know when you're sinning. You know, you're informed then as to what's going on. So... My suggestion is to engage the program with some enthusiasm. Allow yourself to think about things a bit, wonder and ponder about things, ask questions. You, I know, notice many of you are already writing down your questions up the back, which is really, really good. We'll try and answer some of those questions in the next in the Q and A next. And as we go through the Q and As, we'll try and get to some of those questions. And if we don't, as Mary pointed out, we'll try and answer them in our studio work. So a summary. You've seen what we've discussed in the talk and what we'd like to do is remind you of that throughout the, this discussion. We're always referring to God as the infinite entity in which we exist. Literally, in which we exist and which we form a part and all the universe and all of God's laws and all God's principles also exist inside of this infinite being your parent. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Just how God's that parent. An infinite parent. Having an infinite parent, eh? Okay, so what we'll do in our next in a, after the break, we'll just have a short break now for if we can come back at uh, eleven thirty, could we do that? And we will get started on the Q and A, which will be just be a short Q and A for forty minutes or so. Thanks guys.